you know, there was a time, and you, I'm speaking to the experts here, but you know, there was a time in architecture and culture and art where, you know, beauty was passe, right? Beauty wasn't the focus. It was about, you know, I mean, I'm not going to expound to all the experts, but we lost an interest in beauty along the way at one point. And in Indianapolis, we actually have put a stake in the ground, the cultural trail being a good example, but we actually want to be a city where we can connect people to art, nature, and beauty every day for everybody. So I'm your host uh, tonight. Um, this is the third of the four-part series uh, that BSA Foundation has been hosting, which is named as the uh, Fulfilling the Promise, uh, Community Building, and the Emerald Necklace. Uh, you've been, hopefully, to all three of them. For those of you you haven't been, to the previous ones, I'll give a very brief introduction tonight. Uh, tonight's conversation is second of the uh, series that's called Examples from Elsewhere. We have some really exciting um, examples from Indianapolis and Copenhagen to look at as uh, precedents for the Columbia Road Corridor um, that we're looking at as a part of this series. Thank you. Oh, okay. oh that's okay. <laughs> Okay, well, welcome and thank you everyone so much for being here tonight for this really important conversation about the future of the Emerald Necklace and of Columbia Road. Um, as you know, tonight we're looking elsewhere for inspiration, discussing lessons learned in design excellence and in neighborhood connectivity from the Indianapolis Cultural Trail and Superkillen in Copenhagen. Both of these projects link together diverse neighborhoods and move through really distinct um, site-specific conditions in a thoughtful way. They have innovative design and they seamlessly integrate public art. So they think they'll be really relevant to our discussion of Columbia Road. So first, just a, an idea of what's coming tonight. First, I'll introduce the two panelists. They will give a brief presentation of some of their relevant work. Um, I'll start with a few questions and then we'll open up uh, for a Q&A and a discussion uh, with the group. So now please uh, join me in welcoming our two speakers who have come from far and wide tonight to be with us. Uh, first, um, Brian Payne, President and CEO of the Central Indiana Community Foundation. Brian is the founder and leader of the Indianapolis Cultural Trail, a legacy of Gene and Marilyn Glick. The Cultural tra Trail is a $63 million uh, eight mile bicycle and pedestrian pathway that connects arts, culture, heritage, sports, and entertainment venues in Indianapolis's downtown. It was created by taking a lane of traffic away from cars and dedicating it to people on foot, bikes, segways, and wheelchairs. The national consulting firm Project for Public Spaces chose the Indianapolis Cultural Trail as the best North American example of a project that is changing the way people think of cities and city life. The U.S. Department of Transportation awarded the Cultural Trail a $20.5 million stimulus grant. Brian has spoken at national conferences of the American Planning Association, CEOs for Cities, Larger Community Foundations Annual Conference, Council on Foundations, and the United Way. And then Martin Rancano, director of Topotec One. Uh, Martin studied history, art history at Frankfurt University and landscape architecture at the Technical Universities of Hanover and Karlruhe. He, tra he trained in the office of Peter Walker and Martha Schwartz in San Francisco. In 1996, he founded Topotec One. Topotec One participates in a wide variety of international projects and has achieved the first prize in various competitions, including the first prize in the German Landscape Architecture Award 2015 for the Project UNESCO World Heritage Site, Abbey Lorsch. Martin has been appointed as a guest professor in academic institutions in Europe and North America, including the University of Pennsylvania and Harvard University. Presently, he teaches at the Dessau Institute for Architecture. He frequently lectures at internationally renowned universities and cultural institutions and regularly serves on competition juries. So please join me in welcoming our speakers tonight. And um, Martin will be the first to present some of his work. I will try.
All right. First, uh, I would like to thank you to, to have invited me to, to speak here. I'm going to show uh, a project that, um, that was the result also of a competition that we did uh, for Copenhagen uh, for Superkiln. This, um, this um, project has a lot to do with immigration. Um, it's, uh, it's in a neighborhood where 95% uh, of its inhabitants uh, come from other places than, uh, than Copenhagen or than um, uh, Denmark. Uh, when it comes to immigration, I think that we have to rethink the, the concepts that, that we have around immigration. Immigration have changed in terms that um, is not a linear process anymore as it used to be, but we have a kind of a constant moving, you know, you can be going for, for your whole life, but you also can be going for a year, or you can be going for two or three days as a tourist, or I am an immigrant today for, uh, for being here. And um, so this idea that you go back and forth and, and that we are in a kind of a dynamic system uh, is a very different story to, let's say, the, the founding story of the United States, for example, where you would come and then become an American uh, maybe not the first generation, but at least the second, etc. But the situations we have now, also because of media, is that you, that it's very easy to keep uh, cultur cultural heritage. And um, well, maybe uh, it always been the case. Uh, uh, just the velocity or the the slowness of uh, of it has has changed. So one of the main questions of this competition was how to create um, uh, identity when it comes to this. To these places. So the, the question for the competition was, can you make a public space that will help uh, the immigrants who live here uh, to feel at home and also to make uh, for the citizens of Copenhagen, for the inhabitants that have been there before, uh, to make this process more acceptable? So as you might heard from, from the media, in, in Europe we are in a, in, a, in a bit of a difficult situation when it comes to immigration uh, because there is no, no such thing as, as an immigration tradition. Well, there actually should be. Also people from Europe come from all different places. But uh, since then, the, the idea of the nation states uh, of the 19th century, um, places are tending to be more and more trying to uni unify language, religion, etc. So that you, that you, ha you uh, especially after the Second World War, we have got very um, homogeneous countries with most of, in most of the cases, just one language and also most of the cases one, one, one uh, religion. So, however, that was also different before the, before the Second World War. All the European countries were mixed of, of, of Judaism, Protestantism, Catholicism, and, and, and Islam. So this kind of mix has been, been erased, but, uh, but as a, it is a nature of the world, probably the people also move. Uh, um, immigration is becoming more of, of an issue, and in many, in many uh, situations uh, it has been tried to be... Um, well, let's say the reaction towards immigration, it seems to be uh, economically and politically needed. On the other side, the everyday experiences of it uh, um, can, be, can be difficult, and many uh, governments have been trying to, um, to repress certain things. For example, the burqa, this, uh, this, this dress, uh, was forbidden in France and, and in, uh, in Switzerland by a vote by the people, by uh, involving the communities in a very democratic way. Mosques have been forbidden in centers of cities, for example, they only can build them outside. Uh, it was an initiative, by the way, run by architects saying that, 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 that these minarets don't fit into the picture of, uh, of, um, of Swiss cities. However, there's also another story, and um, well, actually the Swiss don't have cities, actually they have mountains they, and, and, and big villages. So it's a wrong argument. So, but there is also a positive story of Europe, and, and this is the, 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 the other story. It's a story of, of emancipation, a story of, uh, of, of groups that always, uh, from being repressed, found their way to being accepted and, 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 and full members of society. So, and, and I think that with, uh, with immigrants, we're in a similar situation. In which, uh, uh, in which a process of, of emancipation should be, should be developed. And um, I myself do believe that it's good to be uh, generous and, um, and not to get scared by certain situations that happen to us, uh, because fear in the end leads to, uh, to, um, to repression and to, and to go backwards. So, uh, so, so this is a sentence after, you know, there was this attack in, in, no, in Norway uh, by this crazy guy who, who went shooting on that island and, uh, and the, and the uh, chief minister or, 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 
uh, chancellor of um, of um, Norway, he he had this. Uh, he, he said that after that that uh, we shouldn't we shouldn't adapt to to these kind of things. So this is one part of the story. The second part of the story is I'm a landscape architect, uh, looking for there is a history actually of uh, let's say an imagine imaginatory tradition. Well, like all the traditions, by the way, are pictures in the end. I think that are made. Traditions are not given or are not, uh, 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 well, they are not God-given. Some people do believe so, but I, I do not. There are things that we make and, and we also constantly inter uh, uh, interpret in different, in different ways. However, the English landscape park, as, as let's say the archetype, you know, it's like when a child would draw a house, he would do like a roof like that, a chimney and, and, and two walls like that. When a child would draw a park, he would have like some temple or ruin, a lawn and a tree. So the, the landscape park, the English landscape park became the, the archetype. And I used to deeply hate it uh, because it has been so much uh, uh, overdone and it became so much kitsch that I thought it's not, um, and, and also so much fake that I thought it's actually faking reality, so it can't be good. We have, when we do things, we have to be honest. So even when we fake, we have to be honest. But on the other side, what is interesting in that, uh, in that, st is that style is the ability to, uh, to actually create traditions, not to mix things together, trees from different areas, architectures from different areas, full of misunderstandings, obviously. But this kind of eclectic position, I thought, could be also an interesting analogy to what we are doing here in uh, in Copenhagen. And um, uh, you know, it, it, we also call the English landscape park the pittoresque, you no? Know, because it's out of picture. So the picture was first, and the reality was after. And this is a, a, a Claude Glass, you know, Claude Laurent and Nicolas Poussin were the two painters that motivated the, the landscape architects of those days to do gardens like that. And this this thing is like an, the iPhone of those days. Oops, it's gone. I think I need some help. Well, this uh, this Claude glass, however, is um, is like a mirror, and in terms of experiencing the landscape, let's say there is a, a, a new way of experiencing space through the English landscape park. You know, before that, with the Baroque, the Baroque was a uh, was a style of framing. You would have a frame, you would have the hedges, the, the, the simplicity of the space, and the simplicity of the space would frame the activities of the court. Okay, that totally changed the aspect of space. Totally changed. And actually, the moving through the space became the, the actual experience. So you would have to move, and in the end, it would be like a movie. Instead of the movie running in front of you, you would be running from picture to picture. You know? And to have that experience even being more more strong, you would have this kind of augmented reality tool that would be, as I said, a kind of an iPhone. It was just a mirror with a frame, so that you could be sitting somewhere and framing your favorite your favorite picture. You know? And you also could be actually walking through the space like that. You know? having the future in front of you, <laughs> the past behind you, <laughs> the present when you would be standing in a kind of fluid of time, of time and space. And this kind of borderless, as we know, also the English landscape gardens didn't have walls. You know, they had the, what they call the haha or aha, they were just uh, uh, hole, uh, how do you call it, like uh, 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 holes or, or, or dives or whatever, that, uh, that actually uh, would be an impediment for animals or people to enter your property, but you wouldn't see them when you would look out. So, and this idea that there is a, 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 a connection or an idea that we don't want borders anymore, as one of the ideas, even if they are there, they are, they are hidden. Then the idea that you know, that, there, that, the, that there is a dynamism in the way you experience the space. And if you want the whole of the United States and many other places in the world have been developed like that, and. Um, so I thought that maybe in all these stories there would be maybe some ideas for us to, to continue. Um, uh, and also what, what I thought interesting, we call the English landscape part, today we call it English. And, uh, but actually nothing in it is English, no? I mean the architecture is copied from, from Italy or from, from wherever. And on, also the trees are actually not really English, so because it's all together with the discovery of many other places. and uh, and. Um, and uh, so, and then the question was, for example, that there is no 
better place for a Lebanon cedar to grow than England, you know? And, uh, and the question is, is a, is, a, is a Lebanon cedar actually Lebanese? Even if it, it grew, it was brought maybe as a seed to England. And this is maybe a little bit of a question that, that, that works with immigration as well. So can things actually be two, three, four things at once? Does identity has to be a pure issue? Or isn't it much more anywhere, everywhere, I in different, uh, maybe in different intensities, something that is also a process, a process in which you become something that you want to be and that your uh, surroundings influence. And what the other thing that I like about the English Landscape Park is that actually it's full of misunderstandings in terms of translations. You know, when you, when you immigrate, you also translation is part of your experience. So you translate, you learn a new language, and also learning new ways not only transforms your mind because you learn new things, but it also transforms your body, you know. The, the, depending on the language that you speak, you use different, la different parts of your, uh, of your face, different muscles. That's the reason Americans look a little bit like potatoes, because they, they speak <laughs> with... And we Germans, we speak like from here. We look always a bit angry. So however, <laughs> and uh, I have another good one to be a bit more racist. The French, you know, they're the, the only people who fart actually when they speak. I don't know if you've ever, ever <laughs> seen that. They say like, <laughs> yeah, c'est la vie. Yeah, that's the reason they have these beautiful lips. They never need Botox, yeah. <laughs> however, that shows, that shows how the transformation, how identity is not only an issue of mind, but also a question of body and a question of space. And that's what we are doing. And one of the things of translation is that many of the objects that you will find in an English park, in an English landscape park, being all objects foreign and becoming English, so a kind of an oxymoron, is all these objects are also, uh, let's say, bad translations. Is not only translocations of objects, but the things are always out of scale. They obviously don't use their original material, but the material that you would find uh, in England. So it's a sandstone. So you have so the temple is in the same time Greek, but it is also English. And this kind of uh, of um, hybrids uh, is what interested interested us in this in this project. Another story is the um, uh, the Lord of the Rings. You might know. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an important movie that started the fantasy movies uh, going around and the village done for the movie was built in New Zealand and they actually wanted to take it away but then people started to go to New Zealand actually because they wanted to see that village, actually a village that never really existed but suddenly things that don't exist can become part of an identity. And, uh, and, and now it's 100% pure New Zealand, no? When you visit the... Uh, and actually, Air New Zealand is the official airline of Middle Earth, yeah? <laughs> so, in the end, you can see how, uh, how, how procedural it is, how identity and what seems to be belonging to you since ever actually can happen, can happen in you. And you know, you know this one? Yeah? Uh, Rocky, you know? And uh, big American story. And when you go and visit Philadelphia, actually next to these steps is the, is the museum of the city, the art museum of the city. There is actually a statue uh, remembering him. Also a person that actually never existed, but a very actually pretty bad Italo-American actor. No? <laughs> so we, we actually seem to, 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 to mix uh, things that are real and things that are not real. And, but these things actually help us to define who we are and, who, and, and where we belong to. This project tried to use these kind of um, ideas of integration, of emancipation, and the ideas of, uh, of a strategy of, of landscape architecture, especially in the English Landscape Park. However, one very important thing that might be relevant for your project here, um, and it's a little bit of a side story of that, is the, is the whole procedure that lead to, the, to this project. And it was a procedure that started with, uh, with an idea uh, founded by the city to, to create uh, and to update some of the spaces of the city. It then um, uh, combined, oops, and it, sorry. Then uh, the second step was to join forces between um, foundation and the city, something very unusual for, for Europe, quite usual in the United States. But in Denmark, there is one foundation that came out of a building collective, and they have a lot of money, and their main goal is to, uh, it's called Realdania. It's really very, very interesting, and it's run by architects, so it's really cool. And, um, and they, they actually put the money together to, uh, uh, to, to do this project. So the, the next thing was to do a competition. We won that competition together with, uh, with, a, with a group of artists called Superflex and, and architects called uh, Big, that you probably know as well from, from uh, Copenhagen. 
And the idea for this, for this competition was to create a park that would have three, three different parts. And this park would be in total form, like the people who live around it, all the objects, all the, all the trees and everything should be foreign. It should be part of a, of a process in which part of, um, these objects would be proposed by the communities, by the people living, living here. So, uh, so we had some proposals already done for the, for the competition. And, um, uh, uh, but then the, the general public was invited and there was a kind of, uh, of, a, of a concept of, um, of communication and, um, and collaboration with the, with the general public. And this had like three, four different uh, strategies. The first one was uh, to, um, to, uh, to use uh, printed media to uh, to have to have uh, announcements put in there, so th so that uh, so that before the project was even going on, there was a sense of information about what we wanted to do. Then there was uh, uh, um, another 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 strategy was to to contact the people who live in the community, but um, and and then the fourth one was to have also a homepage. So. The, this is probably things that also would happen everywhere and are not that different. I think what was different, however, is that uh, our approach was much more, let's say, uh, we call it a hedonistic approach to, to uh, participation. So instead of having this kind of ongoing discussions and meetings like this that are usually not very entertaining, uh, um, the, the aim was trying to involve the community and also the communities we have here, you know, to collaborate and to participate also requires a certain amount of belonging. You know, if you, if you don't grow up, if you didn't grow up in Denmark, you might not speak the language well. You might also have other problems to, to discuss how your park is going to look like. So the question is, how do you create another way of, of communication? And the idea was to say it's much easier to involve the people through these objects, then um, to try to discuss with them, let's say, pro uh, sometimes programmatic issues, etc. So it was more of an emotional approach, you know, so that everyone from his uh, cultural or, or national background could propose objects for the for the um, for the space. So the next, um, so the next, the next, the next step was the, the usual meetings with with different with different people of the community, but it was also. Uh, uh, we were also trying to, um, to, inv to, to, to go and visit certain groups that maybe otherwise wouldn't be involved. For example, we visited, uh, there was a strong um, dance club of elderly. There was a bowling club uh, established in the neighborhood. So to places and actually to meet people that you wouldn't probably, that they wouldn't probably go out themselves to, to join these kind of processes, but you go and, and, and talk to them, yeah? We uh, and out of out of this, uh, we went to see um, this one is I think the one of ah this one was a, 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 a bebop like a music uh, a, a group that that, that 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 we visited and so and out of this uh, of these visitings of this um, research that we did different objects came out yeah um, so I just run through it so that I have enough time to um, to continue so these are the different objects and. Um, you know, one thing that is really relevant when it comes to, to this kind, for me there are three or four issues that are relevant when it comes to this kind of projects. One is this kind of hedonistic approach to participation, not trying to be kind of, not to have a, too much of a do-gooders approach, you know, you're poor people, we're going to help you. If you have this kind of, of attitude, you're probably going to lose on, on, on communities, you have to, to engage and, and, and they have to feel that you're enjoying as much as they are, otherwise uh, uh, if, if this honesty is missing, I think that then you, don't, you are only going to create very artificial things. The other thing is trying to get this kind of project in terms of financing as part of infrastructure because cities usually have money for, for roads and, 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 and this kind of thing. So if, uh, if public space becomes infrastructure, I think that works. And the other thing that is very relevant is the idea of the narrative. You need a story. And sometimes, as we heard before from, uh, from Keresh, is that uh, sometimes the stories are there, so you don't need to reinvent them. Sometimes you have to just enforce what is there, and sometimes you need to invent them, uh, 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 and so. So one of the objects proposed for the space was proposed by a group of um, of Palestinians. They actually proposed to do a, one of the tunnels between Gaza and, and Israel, you know, where they transport the bombs to, uh, to, and we said, so maybe I don't know if this is such a good idea. And, um, 
But then we said, um, but maybe what is interesting is actually the earth out of the tunnel, you know, because earth is such a strong uh, uh, thing when it comes to belonging and being part of a place. So, and this is then the objects, uh, 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 is actually this red earth that you will see here, so it's actually almost inappearant, it's like a stain, but for the people, for this uh, Palestinian group, it's an, important, it's an important object. So, and part of this narrative was that five of the objects actually that were placed on site we actually went with the people to the places, to the places where they proposed the objects from. So we went to Spain to get uh, a, a bull, we went to Thailand, to Bangkok to get a boxing ring, and we went to Jamaica to get um, a loudspeaker, and we went to Palestina, to Israel, to uh, get Earth. So, and obviously these, these stories then appeared in, in media and created this kind of spectacle around, and, and that there is a story, so the story became bigger and bigger, and for, for example, the dance club people we picked up, uh, actually it, it in the end uh, never got built, but we went to, um, to a place in America, actually I forgot where it was, to pick up a dance pavi pavilion uh, uh, that was that lady. And so, and so the whole site uh, started to being uh, uh, created. So this is a picture here. You can see the Baltic Sea in the back. And it's, it's actually also kind of a, of a girdle, of a, of a ring where the tram used to be a super kill means kill means wedge, by the way. So it's a super wedge. That's just the form. And you can see the different parts. And also, uh, Copenhagen is a pretty uh, uh, gray city. So the idea was that also the paving is very strong and colored. So that it's really an impact. Yeah. And um, yeah, this is this is a, this is a, one of the objects that were proposed by one of the inhabitants. It was a guy from Muscat who said his his uncle actually uh, paid him to go to Copenhagen, and he's a dentist. And that was his sign. And um, and what happened is like in the English park, there is a, a kind of a translation and something that was kind of totally foreign becomes also Nordic and uh, it's a little bit Vorsprung durch Technik, you know, it's like, uh, 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 so it's actually both, you know. And what was for us very important is as a certain humoristic, you know, tolerance has a lot to do in being capable of laughing about yourself and not taking yourself too serious and also accepting that something that might for you being of total relevance might be for some other people of total uh, uh, unimportance. And, um, and this is what, uh, what I think makes our um, uh, uh, life together. So that it was this object is from America. Um, it's a donut sign, there is a, this is from, so and in, in, in difference to the English park, we actually took objects from, uh, from um, like everyday objects, so it's also advertisement objects, not only the kind of heroic objects, but also objects of everyday, because they also g give a sense of belonging uh, uh, today, maybe much more than any heroic, uh, heroic stuff. So then it was painted. So we wanted to have a fast result. This is a community that can't like wait 100 years, like in Olmsted days, to have a nice park. I have two minutes. Yeah, I let's see what I what I risk, <coughs> what I take out of it. <coughs> Thanks to global warming, we have also palm trees. <laughs> and uh, that was the opening. Let me just tell you one more story that is relevant. And this one is from Iraq. Yeah. Uh, that is relevant to me, maybe the, the loudspeaker and also the boxing ring, you know. Uh, this is maybe shows m m best our approach. You know, when you, when you work in a community where violence, for example, is an issue, you could like uh, go and say, oh, let's pacify it and let's be nice and take a Bible with you and let's pray and let's see if that helps, yeah? Mostly it doesn't. So the, our approach is to say, is, uh, are there ways to, let's say, civilize violence? Is there a way to use the violence, the, the, the energy that is there in another way? So one of the, and we call it like aesthetic of conflicts, you know, good urban situations are also places that also uh, deal with conflicts in a good way. The total pacified areas are mostly totally boring suburbs, no? So good urban areas, we also like a little bit the danger. We don't want it to be too, too peaceful, no? Then it, it loses well. However, in that area, violence was an issue. And you know, when people, uh, if you punch someone in the face on bare ground, that's a crime, you go to prison or whatever. But if you do the same 50 centimeters above ground with a little bit of, of rubber around it, then it's sports, no? So sometimes it's also a question of the perspective that you have on things and also how to catalyze processes. So as identity is a process, also neighborhoods, uh, you are not going to offer a solution for things, you have to offer a process towards maybe something uh, something better. Uh, but also, and that's I think what is always very difficult for us as planners, accepting also 
certain situations because we are natural do-gooders. But we have to fight against it and also accept that there are negative things that you need to deal with a little bit maybe like a, like a psychologist in terms of, you know, when you go to a shrink, uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't tell you I'm going to solve your problem. He's going to tell you you're, I'm going to help you to change the perspective that you have on your problem so that your problem becomes a part of you and something that is tolerable to you. And I think that's something that we should do also with places. Thank you very much. Uh, that was terrific. Uh, my name is uh, Brian Payne. I'm the president and CEO of the Central Indiana Community Foundation and the Indianapolis Foundation. And while Elia brings up the slides, um, uh, I actually had the great uh, pleasure of uh, traveling on, by bike through Hope, Copenhagen for a week with People for Bikes. I actually experienced all that, but I didn't know the story behind it. So that was uh, amazing for me to learn uh, all of that. So I'm going to be speaking about the Indianapolis Cultural Trail, a legacy of Gene and Marilyn Glick. And one of our thoughts uh, when we first started this in 2001 was we wanted to, you know, we wanted our city, you know, Indianapolis. Uh, I'm a native. I'm a native of California. I was. Uh, I moved there to run its uh, its version of the, your Huntington Theater, uh, the major professional regional theater, in 1993, and then in 2000 got the chance to become the uh, president and CEO of the Community Foundation. And one of the things that I don't suffer from as a Californian is this Hoosier humility that uh, I think Indianapolis suffers from. Indianapolis, it's a lot better now than it was when I moved there in 93, but has a bit of a chip on its shoulder. We actually do get pretty upset that uh, the coast just completely ignore the middle of the country. That actually does upset us. Um, and, and one of the ideas about this was to try to do something that was big enough and bold enough and beautiful enough that the rest of the country would have to wake, you know, wake up and say, hey, well, hey what, Indianapolis, something's going on there. Uh, we should check it out. And uh, that was one of the ways we raised $63 million, is to kind of put it out there as a, as a big idea. Is that right? Is that what I'm doing? OK. So this is the Indianapolis Cultural Trail. Um, this is the route. It's uh, eight miles. And it's basically a rectangle in the heart of our downtown. This is, our, um, this is actually an incredible public space called Monument Circle. And uh, people who come visit, who are usually are, you know, people like you, architects, landscape architects, they actually see that as one of the great European piazzas in all of America. And it is actually designed like that. We haven't done a great job of activating it with the restaurants and, and, the, and the life. It, it's OK. It's OK activated. But that's the, that is actually the physical heart of Indiana. That is like the center of all of Indiana and the center of Indianapolis. And um, so you can see that we basically, in our city, kind of the development goes north. So this is the heart of our downtown. Then we have a corridor to Fletcher Place and Fountain Square, and we have a corridor to, uh, through Mass Avenue, and this is an important, this is college. So East, Mass Avenue east of college was uh, a very troubled, just desolate place, and I'll talk about that here in a minute. So that's eight miles, and the idea of the cultural trail. I had just gotten hired as the CEO of the Community Foundation at a time when a new mayor came in, and a new mayor finally activated a long time plan that said, hey, you know what? We're going to do a cultural development commission to try to make Indianapolis more of a cultural destination city for our uh, residents and visitors. And by the way, I meant to hit my own clock here, so I uh, really pay attention to time. So I'm setting this now not at 10 minutes. I'm going to cheat and set it at nine minutes. And then I'm going to rush through after this goes off with five minutes, and then we'll be done in 15 minutes. So we, because we do want to get to all your questions. And, uh, and Laura has a lot, great, a lot of great questions, too, I was uh, warned. So cultural districts. So the idea this mayor had finally activated this idea that the city would come up with a million dollars a year to be matched by our big uh, private foundation, Lilly Endowment, with another million dollars a year. So there was a 10, a 10 million five-year effort to make Indianapolis more of a cultural destination city. And I was appointed as the new president and an art, former arts leader um, as one of his six commissioners. And the early idea was we should, we should actually take these urban village areas that were kind of mostly down on their luck in, in the year 2000 when this started and really make them 
and, and, and manage them and product develop them and maintain them and designate them as cultural districts. They had great bones, but not much was going on in these districts. And I thought that was a brilliant idea and was looking for kind of something to hang my hat on as the new president of the Community Foundation. And I thought, well, we'll get my own board to partner on this and we'll get our donor advisors, our donors at the foundation to partner on it. And no one liked the idea. I got no traction. Um, basically, they said these cultural districts were too disconnected from each other and too disconnected from downtown, which is ridiculous. But it's, it felt that way because the journey to these districts were ugly journeys. And as we all know, ugly journeys seem like far journeys. And so this is where they are. This is uh, the cultural district. There's another one. There was one really vibrant cultural district at the time, Broad Ripple, which is five miles north of, Mass, of the Mass Avenue district. And so this, is, again, is the heart of downtown. I mean, some of these are within, easily within six, eight blocks. Um, but they just didn't have a lot going on. The, the activity in 2000 that was good was the circle north in the rectangle, and these corridors just didn't seem like they uh, had a lot of value to uh, a lot of our, our leaders, and I thought we could change that. So what is the cultural uh, trail? It is a, a buffered. It's always, always buffered in, in various different ways, but the, the least amount of buffer is a curbed four-foot buffer before we have eight feet for bicyclists, another buffer, and then pedestrians. That's about four miles, it looks like this. Sometimes we have a 10 or 12 foot, a shared pedestrian and bicycle path um, where we don't really have storefronts, and so we didn't need to do the, uh, the extra um, kind of right outside the door paving. So that's what it looks like in, in theory, in principle. And that's what Alabama Street, which is the first that we built um, in 2007, that's what it looked like before the Cultural Trail. And that's what it looks like right now. So if you came out of a, out of a storefront, you'd walk on this. This is the bicycle trail. We do have a lot of people just walking on the bicycle trail. And it seems to manage itself. We don't have to try to, uh, only on super busy days, um, do we have an issue with that? And it basically works itself out. And you can see that uh, we've put a premium on landscaping, we've put a premium on, uh, on design, and try to make it really a beautiful urban space. And we lit it up for nighttime use. So just a few other pictures so you can get kind of a sense of how the trail works and looks. That's our downtown canal, um, which, which the trail connects to. And that's actually a Sasaki-designed uh, uh, project. And the trail has actually kind of co-opted it. So that's actually part of the cultural trail as well. Another that, and there's more of the trail. I want to go back. One of the things that we learned from uh, uh, sending a project for public spaces around Europe to look at best practices was if you're going to have bicycles go both directions on one side of the street, you really, really have to get people's attention, the vehicle attention at the intersections. So we really put a big premium at the intersections. And we shrunk every intersection by creating a what we call um, a uh, intersection plaza that bumps out and shrinks the intersection for the bicycles and the pedestrian, usually to like two lanes. And then we did these very colorful designs of the Cultural Trail logo so that uh, you cannot mistake that you are going to deal with the Cultural Trail as a motorist and that you'll learn quickly you need to look left and right no matter which direction you're going. So a few more pictures. Again, landscaping is a very important part of it. We wanted to make it beautiful. So, um, so, what, so what happened was uh, just a little bit more about how this all started. Um, got no traction whatsoever on the, the cultural districts. And um, I kept pushing it, I kept pushing, I, I ended up not, you know, getting pretty discouraged. And then one day uh, when my son was two years old, and he's graduating from high school in two weeks, but when he was two years old, uh, as a new dad of a toddler who had him from the time he woke up on Saturday morning uh, to the time he went to bed, like two in the morning on Saturday night, um, he was my job, he was my full-time job on Saturdays. And after playing logos for about two hours, my, what I learned was I'm going to buy a bike. I'm going to get a bike child seat. I'm going to start biking. And I've heard about this Monon rail trail that was very popular. And one day when I was riding that with my two-year-old um, on a beautiful spring fever day, 
where about 10,000 people were on this Monon Rail Trail, um, which is north of downtown. Um, I thought, you know what? People love this trail. We'll just do an urban version of the Monon and connect these cultural districts, overcome this problem that they're disconnected from each other in downtown. And uh, it seemed like a simple idea to me. I was a theater guy and a new, uh, I was a, and it was a, it was a new uh, CEO at a foundation. And I knew nothing, zero, about civil engineering. And if I had known anything about civil engineering, I would have known not to take on this project. But my ignorance was a huge enhancement to this project. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to connect to major amenities. We wanted world-class design. And we wanted you to know, I had a lot of experience doing, uh, as I was doing research. So many cities, I'd be on a great bike trail, a greenway trail, and all of a sudden, I would, in a, in a foreign city to me, I would get to the point, and it's like, I don't know where to go from here. Do I go left? Do I go right? Am I about to get myself in trouble in a neighborhood I shouldn't be in? And we wanted to completely take that experience away. So the idea is you always know where you're on the cultural trail, and we'll never take you anywhere that's not safe, not safe from vehicles, and not safe from neighborhoods at this point that you maybe uh, shouldn't be in if you don't know them. Um, we also wanted to celebrate Indianapolis as a 21st century city of innovation and progressive quality of life. And uh, we had a lot of people push back where they wanted old time kind of lights. They wanted to have the trail be some kind of harking back to previous decades and, and eras of Indianapolis. And we basically said, we stayed firm. We said, no, the trail is about positioning Indianapolis for the 21st century, it's not about celebrating the past. We'll do that, we'll connect to heritage, um, but it's really about the future. Of course, safety and mobility is very important. Um, this, this idea grew, it kept growing and growing and growing. It grew to this idea that the trail not only would connect the five down cultural, downtown cultural districts, not only that it would connect through the, through the Monon Trail up to the very successful Broad Ripple cultural district five miles north, but that actually we learned by adding this, adding that, and, and changing a route, that we could actually connect to every significant arts, cultural, heritage, sports, and entertainment venue in all of downtown Indianapolis. And downtown Indianapolis was thriving in, in 2000, just these districts outside were not. Um, we really, we had to go out and raise a lot of money. The city, we, the city didn't put any money into this, and we knew that up front. Our city has been claiming it's been broke forever. And, um, and, and in Indiana, we don't like to pay taxes. And even the state won't let the city pay, city pay taxes. So it's a challenge. And so we knew we were going to have to raise money. And we decided we we're going to raise money by saying this is all about positioning Indianapolis for talent, attraction, and retention. It's about uh, innovation. It's about putting ourselves on the map. It's about getting the attention of people who graduate from Harvard or Stanford and getting them to come and live and use their talents in Indianapolis. I got five minutes. And then I'll get out of here and we'll do questions. So let me just hit that five minute thing. I think we're gonna be okay. Um, so those are some of the lenses that we use to talk about, to sell the trail. We had a lot of community partners. In Indianapolis, nothing gets done without partnership. And uh, we're a great partnership community because that's how you build a successful city that doesn't have some of the natural attributes that other cities have. So we were able to get all these people to be kind of advocates and partners. They didn't put any money in. But they stood up and they said they liked the idea and that they thought it was a good idea. And we pretty much captured every sector of the community as an advocate. So the funding, it ended up being 63 million. It started at 35 million. It went up to 50 million. Then it went to 63 million. And, um, and that was uh, somewhat just bad cost estimating at the front end and somewhat uh, of, uh, of um, inflation and just costs going up. Um, we ended up getting $35.5 million in federal transportation grants uh, that we got Tiger One money um, in 2010. And in that year of Tiger One, uh, 1,400 proposals uh, hit the Federal Transportation Department, totaling $58 billion in proposals for a $1.5 billion uh, pool. Um, 51 projects out of 1,400 got funded and we got all 20.5 million of what we asked for. And then we raised 27.5 from private donors. And again, it was us as a f community foundation that led this. The city was a great partner, but they said, this is, you need to be the face of it, and you need to raise the money, 
and we'll be a good partner and give you the uh, city streets that you need to do this, but you have to make it happen. And then the, the Glick family gave 15 million, one five, and we have many other donors give a million or two million, and then lots that gave a half a million. So we, we didn't ask anyone for less than 100,000 um, because you can't get to 63 million asking for uh, uh, five or one and 10,000 at a time. We did have people come in with 10,000 and, and 25,000 who, who turned us down for 100. Um, economic driver, the trail now, which was completely finished in 2013. Um, since then, or since the beginning of it, from 2018 to 2014, um, we've seen a billion dollar increase of property values of properties within 500 feet of the trail. This is a 148% increase. The rest of the county during the same time, 0% increase. So this was a time, you know, of the Great Recession, 2009, 10, 11, 12. Not a lot was going on in commercial real estate, but it was going on along the trail. Um, and there's been hundreds of millions of dollars in new, new development. And if this new other development east of college, that what I was telling you, east of college was really challenged, and there's been a development announced, a $250 million development replacing an old Coca-Cola bottling plant that had our Indianapolis Public School buses, as it, it was a bus garage, and that's now going to be an incredible mixed use that's going to include a boutique hotel, one of the first of five um, uh, West Elm hotels in the country, and uh, that will now, if, when that happens, will be well over a billion dollars of new development on the trail. So this is what the trail looked like along Virginia Avenue in one of the cultural, what's now a cultural district, uh, that's in Fletcher Place. Um, that's what it looked like, and now that's what that street looks like now. And this was a, a empty building, uh, had two sides of it, and now we have a, a nationally award-winning restaurant called Bluebeard with great outdoor seating and a great coffee cafe next to it along the trail. Um, this, the big feature of Virginia Avenue was the worst Department of Motor Vehicle branch in, in all of Indiana. Um, and uh, now that's what it looks like. Uh, there's just, and there's still more construction going on right now. And this is Massachusetts Avenue. That was, I think, one of the ugliest buildings we had ever seen in Indianapolis. That's been torn down. This is a great mixed use. Uh, uh, more than half of the units are affordable. That is a challenge now. We, we, we are really fo looking at is how to make sure everything uh, it has a balance of affordability as the trail has become so successful. Um, it's just kind of an ugly, challenging intersection, and you really didn't know how to walk across that intersection. And we've solved that, and uh, it's a Julian Opie piece of art uh, there. He's an internationally known artist that we've been featuring. And uh, this is our, our for this site of our former NBA arena that was torn down 20 years ago. And until about a year ago, was a bunch of empty lots, and now that's about two-thirds being done. They'll be our tallest residential luxury apartment in downtown Indianapolis. And uh, one of the things that we said that we were really trying to, um, one of our goals, again, this is Indianapolis, I'm about done, it was uh, we needed, you know, how do you really measure whether, you know, you're hitting your uh, objectives and, and, you know, there's always the financial end, but kind of psychologically we said, we'll know that this project um, was successful when the New York Times gushes about it and gushes about Indianapolis. And so we hit one of the 52 places to live in their annual travel issue that they do every January, and it was all about the cultural trail as why people need to go to Indianapolis that year. And then uh, we have the, one of the three most successful bike shares, or 70 bike share systems, and by all the metrics, we have one of the, one of the, in every metric, we're in the top three because uh, we have done a great job of matching up bike share with bicycle infrastructure that anyone could use. You know, you don't have to know anything about uh, where you're going to go. You can get on a bike and do it very safely and successfully in, uh, along the cultural trail. Bike shares in use. Bike share stations is ever expanding. And then, actually, a new cultural district has emerged because of the cultural trail. Market East, it's going to be with, with that, um, uh, the, the new uh, tower is, and it's about celebrating um, architecture and design, something that we need to do a better job of in Indianapolis, and we are starting to do that, and the cultural trail has been an inspiration for that. 
And I wanted to show you one more thing. Sorry, got off there. So um, part of the Market East Cultural District is a new plaza that we're designing. And then this just opened up. This is Cummins Engine, has uh, established a second headquarter buildings there in Columbus, Indiana, just an hour south of Indianapolis. But now they're on the cultural trail. This is a Deborah Burke design building. And uh, it's uh, getting all kinds of uh, notice and, and awards and uh, is becoming another focal point of Indianapolis life. Um, all right, thank you very much, appreciate it. Well, thank you both for sharing those really fascinating examples. And I think what's really striking about each of them is that they really had to knit into existing neighborhoods. Um, in a way, you know, we, had, we looked at some great examples last week, but those were elevated piece of, pieces of infrastructure that were in some ways separated. And these are ones that were knitting into the neighborhoods and having to pull together distinct um, communities. And so I'm curious, you know, tonight we're really emphasizing design and both of your projects do. And so how, how would you help us in, at, as we think about Columbia Road, balance this idea of a really um, clear identity and a strong design vision with um, moving through conditions that differ neighborhood to neighborhood and through really different communities? Whoever tackle that first? Or? Well, I think one of the issues that um, I mean, I don't know if it's a mistake or, but it's being done everywhere, is to misunderstand beautification with conceptual working on, on places, you know? So I think uh, uh, what you have to be aware, especially if you have a lot of things already uh, on place, also if you want to avoid uh, gentrification in the end, is that the, that the process that the, what you're doing is not only just uh, uh, that it's going to be nicer, but you have to find a way that, um, that it's more useful let's say, uh, and being careful. It's like with the, the you, you can do the do-gooder mistake, but you also can do the beautification mistake, you know, and then you became a kind of decorator of the city, you know, so. And this, I think, it's something that, um, that, I mean, especially if you want to keep the communities that you have there, because I have often the, the impression that that's never really the, the issue. People, uh, in the end, you don't want these kind of communities in your cities often, you know? So you prefer to have them somewhere further away so that you don't see them anymore. So, but if you, if you are honest about keeping them, I think you have to be more honest about the concept that you do. And that and the, the, the project is concept driven and not, um, and this is the difficult issue, of course, to find then the right, the right concept that can be, it can be a competition uh, done to, uh, to do that. Again, I think involvement is very important and an honest involvement, not just a kind of a fake involvement, you know, just one that can also uh, bring things onto the place that you might not like, you know? I mean, actually, only that kind of involvement is real involvement. Otherwise, if you just end up doing what you wanted to do anyway, uh, then you don't need it, no? Well, with our project, we wanted the cultural trail to be a unifying journey through all of Indianapolis's downtown. And at, the, and at the time, though people did, you know, we had probably had the time in 2000, had about 15,000 people living downtown, but they weren't in distinct neighborhoods. Now there's 30,000 people living in downtown, and it would, be a different, it would be a different conversation now if we were trying to start the cultural trail right. with that kind of density of kind of neighborhood um, uh, empowerment. Um, but we really wanted it to be a unifying design. We had unifying design principles. We had one neighborhood, that's a historic neighborhood, that said, we love the trail, please bring it through, but we want, we want like 19th century lighting, you right. know, lighting fixtures. And it was like, no, the lighting is one of the unifying forces of how you know you're on the cultural trail. Mm -hmm. And um, we basically said if they were gonna fight us on that, we would take the trail through another neighborhood. <laughs> and they backed down. But, the conversation would be, you know, would be different in different neighborhoods. And we're actually working on, we're exploring at the foundation that I run with uh, about 15 other partners in conversation about whether we try to do a $100 million follow-up project, which would be more about access and equity and connecting neighborhoods to uh, opportunity. And that would be a, a whole different kind of conversation. And I think that's not going to be the cultural trail. That's going to be a series of connectivities that I think would speak to Martin's experience about what that neighborhood wants. Do they want it at all? If they want it, 
how is it an authentic representation of that neighborhood? I think it'll be a completely different conversation. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Um, you know, one of the questions that, that I had thought about was this question of public engagement. And, you know, you each touched on it to a certain extent, but um, how, what is that balance? I mean, I mean you, you're alluding to the difficulty of creating a genuine process when you have preconceived notions about design. Um, so how can we start to strike a balance between hearing all of the wishes and needs and desires of those communities that we're engaging while also um, opening their minds to different ideas about design that they may not have seen somewhere else um, and, and helping to um, sort of enliven the space in a way that they might not have been able to imagine at the beginning of the process? Well, you know, so we had certain preconceived notions. Right. And, um, and so the lesson that I had f when you have certain preconceived notions is to not go into town halls or neighborhood association meetings too prematurely. Because we've all seen that. I've seen it in another project that got blown up by one, you know, by one, I mean, one loud uh, opponent, you know. I mean, I felt in, the, in that room that day, I had 80% of the people with me on this idea, but the person who was the loudest and who had the most credibility, because he's actually a wealthy person, um, shouted it down, basically. Mm -hmm. And that was the, and then that, and that was the end of the discussion. That was, you know, that didn't, that's not happening. Because of one person in a moment, and I actually was, I knew I was taking a chance, but I had gotten um, impatient, mm -hmm. and I saw an opportunity to make, you know, to push it, push the momentum forward. But I, uh, and as soon as that happened, I thought, no, you have to be patient. So in our system, for the cultural trail, now again, this is, not, this is gonna be completely different when you want the concept to come from the ground up and the grassroots. But that was not the case with the cultural trail. It was a top-down idea, but it was not, it was about, you know, we, had, we did go into neighborhood association meetings eventually, but I had 100 one-on-one -on -one meetings where I was able to test concepts, change concepts, figure out how to sell the concepts, both to, to neighborhoods and to potential donors through trial and error. And during those 100 one-on-one -on -one meetings, I probably had 10 powerful people who said they thought it was a stupid idea and we shouldn't do it. And we just kind of <laughs> isolated those 10 people and didn't invite them to anything and went with the 90 people. Now again, I think that's a brilliant strategy <laughs> if you have a top-down approach. But now our next project will be from the bottom up and that strategy won't work. Mm -hmm. Though, actually, you know what? I think those hundred conversations with a different set of stakeholders will prepare us so that we don't have one hater who can ruin the project. Mm -hmm. I actually still, still think that's part of the process. Sure. Yeah, I mean, well, this is also important. Obviously, it's the typology. I think a street is probably also a different story. And, and, and even more infrastructure, what we did in the end is a park. So it's a more, much more contained project. So I don't, I don't know if they are comparable in that, in that respect. But the project we are talking about here is a street in the end, no? The, 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 uh, the, um, the question would be also how do we perceive a street? Obviously, the traditional way to do a street is to try to create continuity, no? Mm -hmm. and, uh, but there are also other pictures of streets. There are also streets that are not con continuous and they have breaks and, and, and create mm -hmm. differentiation. So, um, I think that, again, I think that you have to be, um, it depends really on the situation. There are so many co uh, contextual issues to take in account, mm -hmm. but you have to be open enough to uh, be capable to, th to think things not only the way you have seen them, maybe, you know, and, and to take serious what you get, uh, what you find on place. And so maybe this is a total continuous design because you want to create this connectivity that everyone knows when I touch that place, I am on that street, yeah. But you also could say no. In the end, as you, as you put it in the beginning, every place seems to not think of the connectivity as much. They think of, the, of, of that place just being their own. Mm -hmm. So maybe every block uh, on Colombia is then different, no? And this is actually the character of it. So mm -hmm. this is a question, again, of how to, uh, to create. But this is more a design perspective, I would say. And um, that also, in the end, is also top down, by the way. It's, not, it, it's just a concept to how to involve people, in which way to involve people. No? Also, to avoid this kind of, uh, of, uh, of non democratic situations where the loudest person becomes your president and in the end too. <laughs> That's but, right. uh, uh, so how to avoid to, to get into these kind of situations. And, and, that, and, 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 and I thought that in Superkiln, the, the idea was to create a chance for everyone 
-hmm. So that there, there was no one kind of, uh, there was no chance to, to, to not have a chance to be involved, you know. But how to create these kind of situations? And it uh, was also easy because we, in the end, didn't have a really a civic society there, you know. There was, because people were poor and so from so many countries, they didn't, they wouldn't think of opposing anyway, mm. you know. Because, so in the end, it was a different, so you have to adapt also to what kind of, um, a general public you need to uh, to integrate. It sounds like you created engagement where it had not existed before, right. which is an amazing uh, yeah. amazing um, outcome of that. You know, I think, I mean, I, as I studied this uh, the last couple of weeks to, a little bit, and, um, you know, like, we, we had made, we had routes that we really wanted to take the trail through. And, and mostly we got our way. And we won, we won, we won one big uh, traffic engineering fight, and we won it against the city's traffic engineers. <laughs> And then we lost another one, but we found, ultimately, we found a solution that was actually better than the original idea. I, you know, the fact that you have, you know, 2.3 miles of one road, and that's kind of, a, I sense that's, it's either like, you, you put that connectivity there, or you don't put the connectivity. Um, that's a challenge, because if you have one neighborhood who really wants to fight that part of it, then you can't link the whole thing. Um, we were ha we had more flexibility. If we if we found that we had barriers on one on one street, we could find another street that would work. Mm -hmm. um, so that I mean I, that that's a big challenge. And then the, it's like how much you know how much fight do you want to fight, right? I mean how much mm -hmm. you know how uh, from a design principle perspective, how much top down and how much influence. Um, creation do you want to create to win that battle over a potential neighborhood that wants to be uh, not see it happen for whatever reason I mean that those are going to be kind of uh, I think you got to get settled on you know what your value principles are in the conversation what you're willing to do to win and what you're not willing to do to win I think one just one thing to, uh, yeah. just listening to you one thing to add I think the the key issue to the success is in the end also the the narrative of the project you know that you create this cultural trail and that suddenly something that didn't exist suddenly exists you know, mm -hmm. that, that there are chances and that you see them and make them and they may become real so and I think this is the and this is probably for projects nowadays with, with or without uh, I mean if you have to finance them maybe the more but also to create um, expectations yeah. Um, mm -hmm anxiety in the end as well you need to create uh, you have to have a strong uh, very strong narratives uh, so that they drive you and then you are capable to to also change direction you can take another road or you can put another object or whatever but if you have a strong narrative mm -hmm. that guides you I think that's um, and that's something uh, Im important to uh, important to invent yeah, or to yeah. I, and it can be to bottom up or or, or, or or top down doesn't matter in the end right, as right. long as uh, as as it works as a, as a, as as something that unites everyone mm -hmm. because i mean uh, who can say anything against a cultural trail i mean you know what i mean it's like uh, <laughs> uh, even yeah, the, the name of it, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, we did have a little bit of a challenge uh, with that name because uh, actually we had some people in Indiana who said, oh, my gosh, if you call it the cultural trail, some people won't get on it because they're afraid <laughs> of culture, you know? <laughs> um, and Seriously, I had the cover. And I said, no, look, people, if you build, you know, people will want to be on the trail and, and the opposite will happen is that people will all be on the, want to be on the trail because it's a great trail, it's a beautiful trail, it gets them where they want to go, and then they'll think, oh my God, I just had a wonderful day on the cultural trail. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should open my mind to other cultural experiences, <laughs> and I think that's actually played out for some of the less cultured uh, people of our, of our state. But you know, I think that, that uh, what you said, Martin, is really important, and um, um, you know, we looked at the cultural trail. We, we had to raise $63 million. So we thought, you know, we build a lot of our narrative around how we're going to raise the money. Mm -hmm. But maybe in this project, the narrative has to be built about how each neighborhood is going to come fall in love with the idea of connecting. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean to them? And maybe that narrative, as, as Martin did in Copenhagen, is that you, gotta, you, you work deeply in that neighborhood, find out what they want to accomplish, right. and then show them how this connectivity can accomplish their own narrative. Yeah, you know, I think what you're both talking about relates to um, the last question I want to ask, and then we'll turn it over and um, hear everyone else's questions. But, you know, really thinking about when the emerald necklace was designed, 
um, there were different ideas about the use of parks, about the relationship of people to nature. Um, so as we're thinking about what the future is, uh, both of connective spaces um, like Columbia Road and, and really the system as a whole, what are you seeing in your work and, and what are your sort of recommendations around new uses and programs, um, new ways of thinking about parks and corridors that should be front of mind for us? What have you seen? Yeah, I mean, it depends really on the typologies. I mean, here you have a street, so it is mainly infrastructure. So I don't know how much space you have. So it's not a question of a park in terms of use. But as the streets are changing, no, the, the, we might get uh, self-driving cars on some point. Uh, the the uh, car, uh, bicycles and pedestrians have another importance. Um, the use of the street as a public st uh, space in, in terms of having, having uh, an offer to sit, to sit there and, 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 and have a coffee or whatever. Mm -hmm. So these kind of, um, of uses are, uh, are changing all over the world. No, I, I, I mean, I remember in Germany 30 years ago, you would have beer gardens, you know, but no one would have like a, like a cafe like in, like in Italy or, or in France. And now this kind of qualities happen probably all around the world, this kind of uh, Mediterranean culture of, of the use of the space is becoming more and more of a standard. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so I think I would like to, co to come back to this, um, uh, to the, the, the question is also the, the, a question as of perfection or, or, or let's put it the other way around. Is the um, necklace strong enough as the driving force, because he invented the necklace. I mean, you invented your necklace. They didn't <laughs> have it before. But you are kind of missing, you are missing a, a piece of the necklace. The right. question is if this is going to be a driving force enough, especially if the necklace is not such a known story, and also if the necklace is such a falling apart uh, thing anyway, because every object has I such a big uh, identity, like the common or whatever, or, or, or the Commonwealth Avenue are such strong identities of their own that they are somehow connected because they are green, but it doesn't seem to be enough. So you might uh, you might need to find uh, another story to, I mean, you, the necklace you can use, obviously, <coughs> because it's there. But I don't know, in terms of the new, uh, of new ways of thinking of, uh, of public space, if mm -hmm. this is going to be strong enough, or if you have to find and invent another narrative for Colombia mm -hmm. that, that, um, uh, that can be. And what is, uh, we heard it a little bit, I think infrastructure, um, to misuse the questions of infrastructure to make these things happen, you know, that in the end it's a renewal of, uh, of a street. Mm. Uh, it's in terms probably of financing it, uh, uh, maybe a, a good thing. Uh, that's how it is in Europe, at least. You can sell these kind of projects much easier, uh, again, because cities m most of the time have, to have money for infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, so. um, you know, I've had people who always kind of right off the bat, it's like, well, how are you going to program the cultural trail? And yeah. And to me, the, you know, the cultural trail, it's about allowing you to self-program every time you're on it. I, always th I actually always thought, and this is actually proven true, is that I always thought half the people that use the cultural trail would use it to get from point A to point B, but a whole other half would just say, I just want a great urban experience today. It's beautiful. I want to get on a bike. I'm just going to get on the trail, and then I'm going to just kind of decide spontaneously what I do for a moment to moment. Hey, maybe I'll go to our Idle George Museum of Native American and Western Art. I haven't been there for a while. I'm just going to do that today. Or I'm going to go to the zoo. Or I'm going to you know, go to this restaurant or that pub or that microbrewery or that distillery. Um, by the way, on, the, on that Mass Avenue corridor, when we started talking about the trail, actually when we finished that trail, um, there, was, there, there was only two restaurants that existed by the time we started construction on, the, on, on an eight block uh, Mass Avenue. There's 57 restaurants on Mass Avenue and they're all, not, it's not a single one of them is a chain. Wow. They're all, they're all uh, local uh, restaurants. So, so it actually has created this huge restaurant scene that didn't exist and, and a local restaurant scene. Um, but I think the program, you know, the programming is starting now to kind of evolve and actually, um, uh, the, the organization that we, we created a not-for-profit called Indianapolis Cultural Trail Incorporated to market, manage, and main the maintain the trail as a world-class amenity for the residents and visitors of Indianapolis. Part of that $63 million was a $6 million maintenance endowment. Yeah. Um, so that kicks out the first $300,000 a year for maintenance, and then they have to raise a couple hundred thousand additional. But this organization, for the first time, did a Easter egg hunt um, and 4,000 people showed up on a, the Saturday morning before Easter 
to look for Easter eggs, and uh, you know, it was an amazing, it was an amazing success. I mean, um, but that's not how we started thinking about sure. the trail. But I do think, um, you know, I know every neighborhood that has pride about its neighborhood wants to see kind of wants identity markers, wants mm -hmm. the story of their neighborhood told, mm -hmm. both from the narrative that you've been talking about, mm -hmm. but also I always feel like, you know, as you're if, if you're passing uh, on Columbia Road. You know, could you create some really cool artistic gateway that says this is now you're, pa you're passing and you could actually go through and become, you know, visitor to this wonderful neighborhood and tell its story. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, like the BSA does so beautifully around the neighborhoods in their, in their lobby, um, but also create a physical gateway that says maybe I want to take my bike off Columbia and go check out this really interesting neighborhood that I've never explored before. And then it's also a gateway for that neighborhood to get on to the necklace. Right. Right, well, let's hear from everyone here. Yes, question in the back. Please. Thank you, Brian and Martin. That was really, really wonderful. I've been really fan of your work, Brian. Um, oh, thanks. I do know quite a lot about Supervillain, but I'm glad I do now. Um, so I want you to talk a little bit more about, <coughs> excuse me, the talent retention of aspects of like, because the way I studied public spaces and the way I think about it, it's a lot about place attachment and belonging and meaning and really finding a place to belong or to interact with and becoming a steward of the space. So talk a little bit more about that retention aspect. How are you keeping uh, the people that are there as the times change, as the tides change, whatever have you? Like, What are the ways that people do get engaged Let's not talk about in monetary terms some of the other more, more tangible emotional aspects. Okay. So, I mean, you know, uh, the purpose of the trail at the time was to, cre to get Indianapolis noticed by, you know, frankly, the best and the brightest. Because we have Eli Lilly and Company, a major pharmaceutical company. We have a major medical center. We, have, we had at 2000 a small startup scene that has really exploded. We're actually, we may, we're a, maybe the major hub in, in the country for uh, digital marketing. And that came out of a small startup in 2000 called Exact Target that went public and then sold to Salesforce for 2.5 billion. And now we are the second hub. In fact, our 48 tower building has just changed its name from Chase Tower, JP Morgan Chase, to Salesforce Tower. They've taken over and put a thousand people in that building, and so you know that that was what we wanted the trail to do at the time. Now, as it has really transformed the southern corridor of Fountain Square and Fletcher Place, which is um, a Fletcher Pla a Fountain Square, the most southern point, it that's a traditionally um, um, uh, group of. Um, 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 forgetting the name of the, the culture who comes from like Eastern Kentucky mines and uh, Appalachia. It's a, it was an Appalachian cultural place of, of um, three or four generations of factory workers that lived on the south side. And then artists came and kind of made it uh, an, kind of an interesting mix where no one was displaced, but artists filled in all the vacant land there and all the vacant spots. That is the hottest, hippest area along with Mass Avenue. And I've been for five years feeling like, you know, here's the way I look at good development, is hopefully it's 80% with great outcomes for a community, and then it creates 20% of challenges. And how do we celebrate and build on the 80% that's good, and how can we mitigate the 20% that might be bad for certain people, that might price them out or displace them? How do we mitigate that? And, um, we're in, and I've really been trying to study that and talk to experts. And I've actually had some breakthrough conversations just in the last uh, two months and where I've been pretty much told you cannot go to war with capitalism. You know, that's just, you're going to lose that every time, the forces of the marketplace. So you have to get ahead of the marketplace. And right now, um, we're going to do a, a $500,000 uh, our foundation, a $500,000 mortgage at, at 2% as a collaborative to take a 50-unit apartment building that has artists, about half artists, another half low-income wage earners who've been in this 
um, subsidized housing apartment, beautiful, beautiful loft spaces that they're paying $500 a month right now under subsidy for 1,000 square feet, one block from the epicenter of Fountain Square and the Cultural Trail. And, if, and, the, and, the, and the new market tax credits have run out. And if that goes market, that'll go from $500 a month to about $1,750. Still cheap, I know, by Boston standards. But you know, that would completely displace everyone that's in there. And there's a group of, of uh, community organizations that we're part of that's going to keep it um, keep it affordable for the next, at least for the next 15 years. And I think that's what we need to do is we need to go there and invest more in affordable housing and make sure that there's plenty of housing for people of all incomes because that's who's lived there in the past and they deserve, deserve to live there in the future. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's very different um, perspectives, no? Uh, uh, so I, I'm just trying to join the discussion, maybe adding uh, interesting things. Um, I mean, retaining the people. I think one aspect maybe that might be interesting is um, in terms, not now, uh, in, 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 in another scale, is to create a project right away. That means, are there possibilities of implementation that could happen right away? You know, can you do things right away? So instead of uh, sitting down and discussing things, are there possibilities to uh, to create intermediate projects to also because that can be also test fields to find out what is going to work, what isn't going to work. You know, to think of of uh, projects not like a, f uh, a solution. You know, that is kind of final and it's going to be all very capitalistic. However, no, but to think of it more of a process. That in the end also requires maybe less less money and 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 and, and it's a little bit more kind of yeah a little bit softer maybe in the approach so that you it's a bit more uh, cooking slower you know so that you, that you can really find out how the taste can can develop and 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 evolve no and that could be again I don't know this area good enough to to see if this is the if this is the right the right uh, approach. But in general, I think that we have to think of projects as, a, as an ongoing process. Also, after that finish, as we heard, that you need to finance maybe certain housing and helping certain classes to stay and to remain. But on the other side, you also could say that you never come to the level of perfection that these classes are being, to th being thrown out. For me, a successful project is not only a, a project that is financially kind of shiny or whatever, where you have luxury apartments happening now. So, uh, this is that wouldn't be for me not necessarily it can be, but it doesn't have to be uh, a success. A success can also be that you just improve a certain situation in a let's say more articulated, more uh, tuned way, you know? and that also will uh, retain the people. So, but again, I think that uh, this is maybe the whole range from the more let's say frontal war to the more guerrilla activity you know okay. so yeah the choice of weapon is always important it's like with a doctor you have to find out first if the patient has headache neurosis or cancer you know mm -hmm. because if it's a headache and you do a chemotherapy i mean his stuff is a kind of a chemotherapy i would say mm -hmm. no <laughs> so but maybe colombia has just a headache i don't know if it has cancer i would say you, ha you need 100 million dollars and, and 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 you go for it but also you know chemotherapy also kills a lot of good things as well you know, so if you if you misuse it or if you use it uh, in a place where you don't actually need it, and that's what I try to say. So I think that the diagnosis, the concept, the finding out what what is really needed, and it can be the chemotherapy, of course, but uh, but there are many many different uh, different things, and in some areas there are different uh, uh, in the same area also different uh, different approaches needed as well. So yeah, thank you, Corey. You have a question. So I have. Um Different question for each of you, so you don't feel obligated to both respond to the same question. Uh, but I'm asking. That's nice of you. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, I'll ask them at the same time. Can yes. You repeat the That's good. Mm -hmm. um, so my question for you is actually about sort of the postscript of the park mm -hmm. um, because it's been uh, live now for some time, mm -hmm. and you talked a, a little bit about the process and also about yeah. the design outcome. But I'm curious what um, has been uh, the embracing of the community. <laughs> Yeah. process, uh, but I'm curious to hear how, it, yeah. how it's working now. Um, and for you, you um, alluded to the city being a good partner and um, having to fight some battles with the traffic engineers. And so just, I, I'd be curious if you could maybe um, elucidate a little further um, what that partnership looked like. Uh, I think that would be really helpful. Okay. Okay. 
So, uh, yeah, good questions, I agree. Um, yeah, first thing, I mean, the... I mean, it's really difficult to say, and what I said, it's what I believe in, but obviously we are also out of the process now. I mean, the process of the park now is actually me being here, for example, you know, and these kind of ideas become uh, interesting for other people to, to think about if, if one could do things in a different way, you know, and the kind of, uh, the other public space, that, that kind of space as well, no? When it comes to the site itself, um, what is interesting, you know, when the project started, and it had also a lot of uh, uh, people against it, no? Because in the end, we didn't propose kind of a nice park with granite and you know the kind of usual classical uh, stuff. But we proposed to the boxing ring to have violence, you know, in the center of the park. So it was kind of uh, uh, we had a lot of people against it. Also the city, by the way, as it was half financed by the by this foundation, and the foundation was really very clear on our side. Uh, however, I think that. Um, that again, the success, whatever that means, let's say the um, the attraction that the project produced, the uh, the um, uh, people being um, interested in knowing about the project, created so many expectations. You know, the the site is now the tenth most visited tourist attraction in Denmark. Mm -hmm. So they go to see the 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 marmaid. I don't know if you know yeah. Copenhagen at all, but th th there is one little marmaid on a rock that seems to be the first attraction for whatever <laughs> reason. Uh, it's not very interesting. Then it's uh, uh, Tivoli and other things. So, but Super King from being a total deprived area, you know, with crime, drugs, etc., to become suddenly such an attraction. So, and then the city had to rethink. You know, they they put now hundred times more money into the maintenance that they used to. So, as a projects need to create also their own narrative and their own, uh, it's like a baby crying, you know, they have to cry for, for milk, you know, if they do not cry, if they're kind of shy in the corner, they also are not going to, to survive uh, the competition with other places, so, and um, the other thing that is maybe relevant in terms of uh, how it's developing, for uh, one thing that I hear a lot is, uh, you know, obviously the pictures I'm showing are from when it was new, so it's used now, and, but we always meant that it would, <coughs> we, we never looked for, let's say, a classical uh, patina, you know. We, I think that part of it being a little bit ugly is also part of keeping certain classes from being too interested in the, in the area as well, you know. To keep a certain, as I said, to, to balance, let's say, these conflicts, to make them aesthetical, but not to kind of uh, erate them. Because if you erate them, you also get rid of these people. Then the middle classes or the upper classes come and think, what a nice place, I can live here, you know? And it's even cheaper, so it's a good investment, you know? So, and, uh, and, and so, you also sometimes you have to also allow to a certain extent to, to, to um, yeah, to have places that are not, as, that, that still remain a little bit, uh, ugly or whatever that means, a little bit kind of rejecting or, you know, that it's kind of in between things, no? That, that there is a beauty, but mm, a, a bit of dialectic, no? And, and this is something that's very hard for us planners to do uh, f for good reasons. But I think it's in many, in many situations, not always, but in many situations, it's a good strategy. So the, although the city was clear that they had no money to put in the project, um, you know, we basically we had to get approval of the city because we were taking we were taking city property. We're taking the roads that the city controls and changing them and uh, and and completely transforming them to a whole new plan. And the mayor um, actually, in this, and we had to survive a, a shift in mayors that looked that was pretty scary at the moment. <laughs> we only had a half mile done when the very popular mayor that started the project on his third term election got shocked, we all were shocked and he lost. And then we had a new mayor who uh, we just, was a completely unknown and we only had a half, of the eight, half a mile of the eight miles done. But the first mayor um, basically said they couldn't put any money in, but um, uh, once he finally green, and it took him an extra year to make up his mind to give us the green light to do it. And, um, but when he finally said it was okay, he said, look, I'll, we'll be responsible for finding $15 million of the 35 where it started from federal transportation grants. And, um, and so actually they did um, because the last 20 from the feds was, was the stimulus money from Tiger One that, that basically me and my team went out and got um, with the help of the city. But the other 15 
was um, uh, money that came through uh, the MPO, the Metropolitan Planning Organization. Actually, at one point, Senator Evan Bayh, uh, this is probably in about 2006 or 2007, said that he thought he had a chance to do an earmark for the city of Indianapolis. And our mayor was his former chief of staff when he was governor of Indiana. And our mayor said, you know what? If you can do an earmark, how much do you think we can get? He said, six million, I want it for the trail. And then the mayor also used surface transportation funds that could have been used, federal money that could have been used for any road project in all of Indianapolis, 400 square miles, and he used another six for the cultural trail. So, so they did that. They did that. And then, um, so they did come up with, you know, $15 million that they could have used for other things. Um, and then now what they do is they've taken on um, some of the maintenance, what they do is they pay for the electricity for the lights, they pay for the water, it's full, all eight miles is fully irrigated, they pay for the water bill, and, um, and then they don't pick up the trash that people throw on the trail, which is not a huge problem, but happens, but they at least um, empty all the trash cans, and they also uh, are committed, and they're slow on, on, they've been very slow, and I've been getting a little upset about the fact that they're not delivering on their promise, but they do those that, those durotherm, highly designed crosswalks. Mm -hmm. Those last for about seven or eight years, and the city said that it will replace those when they wear out or that streets get cut for utilities. And they finally replaced like six of them last year, but they're behind on replacing those, so we have to hold their feet. So one of my, one of, yes, so um, I had a top administrator from our Department of Transportation on my team. She later became the, uh, it's actually called the Department of Public Works in Indianapolis, but it oversees transportation. And she became the, de the department uh, director and they kept her on the team, even though she got a big promotion. And so she was, uh, they, were, they were a good, solid partner. They kept deferring to me, which, was, which blew me away. I mean, I really thought my job would be to sell this to the mayor say I'll do the fundraising on the private side, and then he would be, he or his chief of staff or deputy mayor would be the face of it, but for political reasons that are too long to go into, but legitimate reasons of politics. He liked the project, but he did not want to be the face of it. So he said, we'll do it, but you have to be the face of it. And then I actually, I'm the one who routed the cultural trail. They let me route the cultural trail. Wow. Um, I lost a couple battles, but I mean, and I mean, I, mean I, I can't understand how they would let me do that, but they did. <laughs> I think I saw a question in the back, yeah. Thank you. So I was had kind of a compare and contrast question here, if that's all right. So a little bit for each of you. Um, I apologize, I've not been to Indianapolis yet, but I did recently go to Copenhagen, which was lovely. And um, just kind of from an outsider's perspective and from what I've heard tonight, it sounds like, and from what I've seen in Copenhagen, there's a real culture of connectivity and cycling and walking and biking and getting outside and using public spaces. So I think you have a lot of physical networks it sounds like you were able to tie into already and then you also had a culture of um, public space use that you could kind of play up and from what i was hearing tonight it sounds like maybe indianapolis had to grow both of those things a little bit more and so i was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit and maybe think about how it would apply to the columbia road corridor where from a high level at least we have the open space network going for us we have the physical infrastructure but i think again maybe similar to indianapolis we do have the opportunity to grow the culture of using those public spaces as well. You know, uh, we did not have a bicycling culture um, when the cultural trail, when we started the cultural trail. And one of the reasons why it has such a chemotherapy, huge kind of approach to it and was so expensive is we thought we had to do something that was such a, a place change agent, you know, that, that we had to, I mean, that, that a, a bike lanes, which we do have bike lanes, and we're not going to build any more bike lanes, by the way. We're only going to do protected bikeways from now on. But we had bike, actually, you know what? We didn't even have bike lanes. I mean, we were such a zero bicycling city in 2000 when this idea emerged that we thought we had to do this in such a big way that people who never rode a bike or haven't ridden a bike in 20 years would feel compelled to get on a bike and be part of this connectivity. So that's why it was so big and bold and it had to be really beautiful because it had to create a culture where none exists. Now because we have this, this next hundred million dollar idea that we're exploring, none of it's going to be the cultural trail. None of it's going to be that expensive. Um, and, yeah, yeah, thanks. And, um, and so we don't have to do that anymore because we have a bicycling culture. One of the things that we're most proud of.
future doesn't have to. Wow. <laughs> I don't think I don't think this one works either. I, is this working? Hello. Okay, good. Wow, I, I've broken two microphones. I'm going to pass this on uh, to Martin. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe one thing that changed. Um, I mean, it used to be natural to do certain things. No, it used us to be natural, for example, to do work with your body. And now, because we don't do that anymore, we do sports, not to, because our body still needs some kind of movement. So we do a lot of things that we seem to need in an, let's say, artificial way. No? And probably the same for public for the use of public space. There was a need of public space in a very different way. You know, and now, uh, especially in Indianapolis, but in the end in Copenhagen as well, it becomes a kind of entertainment. No, it becomes a kind of um, yeah, to a certain extent, a kind of faked faked reality, no? Indianapolis is still probably a very ugly Midwestern place, no? Yeah. Even even with a, with a cultural no, trail. <laughs> no, I no. I really liked you up until that moment. <laughs> I run the Community Foundation. I'm in charge of advocacy for the whole city. I know, I know. I was joking. No, I was just saying, but, but um, so that means that we have to be uh, conscient about what we, uh, what we do. And um, and that also we need we need to um, that it's good to change places no I mean it's for the good that uh, that um, that this that this um, that, that things happen and in the end I think that also one of the uh, one of the good things of globalization is also that we get to to see and to learn about uh, good things from everywhere and uh, and that we all want to have it uh, to a certain extent no so I think that's um, in the end um, yeah. Martin, I think you're, I mean, I've, I've written down a lot of notes seriously about what, I think you're a really interesting philosopher, you know, I think that's really part of your, your work, and, uh, and I think that's a really important thing in this work, and one of the things that I've learned, um, you know, is there was a time, you, I'm speaking to the experts here, but, you know, there was a time in architecture and culture and art where, you know, beauty was passe, right? Beauty wasn't the focus, it was about, you know, I mean, I'm not going to expound to all the experts, but... We lost an interest in beauty along the way at one point. And in Indianapolis, we actually have put a stake in the ground, the cultural trail being a good example, but we actually want to be a city where we can connect people to art, nature, and beauty every day for everybody. And we have a reconnecting to our waterways. We have a, a river that we've never treated very well. We're treating it well now. We have creeks that we've uh, have, you know, have dumped industrial waste into, and we're cleaning those up. And actually, you know what? They're actually incredibly beautiful when we pay attention to them. But so we're actually putting a stake in the ground around art, nature, and beauty, and, and making sure everyone can connect to that on a daily basis. And design is a big part of that. But then you also said, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, beautification is, is an abuse. And I think that's something to really recognize as well. And uh, how to use it, you, got, you know, it's got to be a very strategic approach. Otherwise, if you make every, you know, if you make someplace so beautiful and the rich come in and take it over and kick out the, the, the working class or the, the lower economic class, I mean, I think that was a really thoughtful thing. But right now in Indianapolis, uh, we're, trying to, we're trying to get our citizenry to really, really, really get behind great architecture and great design and, and we're making, you know, and that's the context of which we're living. It's a different context in Boston. No, I think those are two really great points to end on. Um, so we just want to thank everyone so much for joining us tonight. Uh, it's been a really great discussion. So thank you. Thank you.